Well, good afternoon if you are in New York City or somewhere in hot North America and cold South America. Good evening if you are somewhere in hot Europe or hot Africa, um, especially Martina Frank in Southern Italy. Good greetings around the world. I hope you're staying cool. Um, I'm Fred Plotkin. Special greetings, as always, to our loved ones in Ukraine. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. As you know, Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. I'm very happy for many reasons to welcome today's guest, who I don't know personally, but he works in one of my favorite places in the world. He works in a place I know incredibly well. I go as often as I can. Uh, it's a place I've never covered on this program. It's the Festival del Valle d'Itria in Martina Franca in Southern Italy. And my guest is Sebastian F. Schwartz, artistic director of this magnificent festival, now in its 49th season, just beginning this week. So, number one, Sebastian, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I have to ask the obvious question first. How hot is it in Southern Italy? Well, it's between, I don't know, in Fahrenheit, in, in Celsius, it's between in Celsius. Okay. 38 and 40 degrees. Yeah, so it's around 100 to 104. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've all seen worse. Yes, of course. Um, so I've just been notified that there's a slight delay on your side, I guess, because of the heat when I'm talking so that we will speak to each other. I'll pause. I'll let you reply and so forth. The Internet is like everything else in the world heating up. Now, a brief bio of Sebastian. He was born in Rostock and Rostock is in northern Germany. I have been there. Um, it's famous, among many things, for you, but also for a magnificent ch uh, church with a magnificent organ, one of the great organs of the world, apparently. I forgot the name of the church. I could see it in my mind's eye, and I remember the sound of the organ. Would you talk about that, and did you grow up hearing that organ? Well, I've I've actually sung in that church, um, and it's, it's quite an amazing... Up in the in the Baltic, it's this is the Baltic area, right? We're right on the southern shore of the Baltic Sea, just underneath Copenhagen, in a way, underneath Denmark, and uh, that was the um, that's the uh, the area of the Hanseatic League, where we have all those wonderful churches in red brick Gothic style, with um, which were then later in the Baroque period um, uh, uh, furnished with the altars and with the with the organs. And so we have uh, this this very severe Gothic architecture, and then within that we have the explosion of Baroque ornamentation um, in organs and altars. So it's quite quite a stark contrast. Um, so in the in Saint Mary in the Marienkirche, as we say in German, um, there's this amazing. Uh, uh, Baroque uh, organ. I cannot tell you who built it, um, but if you stand in front of it, it feels like it's it. It makes the whole uh, Gothic architecture explode from from its uh, baroqueness. Yes. Yeah. Um, you studied vocal performance and musicology in Berlin, in Venice. Something you and I have in common that we studied in Venice. You have worked at. Many important festivals include and theaters, including Glyndebourne, La Fenice, the Teatro Ander Wien, Torino, Teatro Reggio, and Wexford, among many. And in 2015, you were named Cavaliere della Stella d'Italia. <laughs> yes. What you don't know is that in 2015, I was named Cavaliere della Stella d'Italia in the same wow. year. <laughs> and so I'm honored to meet you, Cavaliere. And for people who don't know what this means, it usually goes to people who are not Italians, who devote their life to spreading and sharing Italian culture and spreading it around the world and, and educating others about it and caring about it very deeply. So that's part of, I, I'm not much for honors, I like them, but what this represents is a dedication to Italian art and culture in all of its forms. And if they've considered you worthy of that, 
um, then I have a lot to talk to you about. <laughs> so, I, I, but I think my first question is, um, for people who don't know this festival, which is really one of my favorites in the world, it's the 49th year, I've been to at least 20 of them, um, in one of my very favorite cities in Italy. Let's talk first about the town of Martina Franca. Mm -hmm. You say what you want to about it, and then I'll add other things. Mm -hmm. I've been coming to the festival and to the area uh, since the year 2000. So I definitely maybe uh, managed to see about 14, 15 editions of the festival. So you beat me. <laughs> um, but um, the very first time I came to Puglia and to this area was because of the festival in 2000. And I've come back whenever I could ever since, because as you say, it's this absolutely amazing uh, place. It's called Martina Franca, it's called the Pearl of, of the Baroque uh, in, in Puglia or in, southern, in, in this part of Southern Italy. And it's actually a, a fairly small town of about uh, 45, 50,000 inhabitants. But with that, it is the largest town in the, in the direct vicinity. Um, we have Ostuni, the famous white city um, nearby. I actually live right sort of halfway between Martina and Ostuni. Um, we have um, Cisternino and Celle Mesapica. Um, they're all very beautiful. They have beautiful uh, old uh, town centers, Baroque town centers uh, with these uh, narrow alleyways. That I know so, that we both know so well from Venice, uh, just that there are no canals here because everything is quite dry. Um, these beautiful white stone or white painted uh, facades uh, in the city center. Martina Franca, being the largest uh, town of these, uh, has the seat of the the former seat of the Duke of the area, and therefore a ducal palace. Um, this amazing structure. I'm seeing a postcard right in front of me right now. Um, with this uh, fabulous iron wrought um, balcony going almost all around the, the noble floor, beautiful uh, fresco ceilings for the for the uh, noble rooms, and and in the courtyard of this of this uh, ducal palace is where in uh, 1975 this festival was was founded. Um, it is really the the largest building in the center of town. Uh, it's it sits up on a hill um, of about 440 meters above sea level. So we do get a breeze and it does cool down in the evenings as opposed to the, the coastlines where um, you keep the humidity and you keep the heat throughout all the night and there's definitely no way of going to sleep ever. Um, so being up here at this elevation um, is perfect for us because it does give also our audiences, of course, a slightly more uh, um, pleasant uh, experience. So um, I'm going to add a few things just for people in the context. Puglia, Apulia, is the southeasternmost part of Italy. It is the heel of the Italian boot. It has a very long coastline. There's a lot of fishery. There's also the Ionian Bay within, and there's the city of Taranto, which is the main port city. And Italy has what are called provincial capitals, and then you're within the province of a provincial capital. And Taranto is the provincial capital for Martina Franca. But Martina Franca and Taranto could not be more different in just about every imaginable way. And part of the name Martina Franca comes from the fact that historically it was a tax free zone and commerce happened there. So it's a beautiful city that was built up in part with palaces and so on, because this is where commerce happened in a very different way from the entire rest of the region. Bari is the, is the regional capital and largest city. It has the beautiful Tatra Pedruzzelli. It's a very animated, lovely city that I really like very much. Uh, there's Andrea, there's Lecce, there's... Um, Brindisi, which is not Brindisi, as people say. Um, there's a little town I like very much called Manduria. And Manduria historically was Jewish. It was where the Jews lived. And so when you go to Manduria, like other places in Italy where Jews lived, you have taller buildings because the Jews were kept in a small area and lived in houses. So in, in the ghetto in Venice, 
and the ghetto in Rome, the buildings are taller because they were closed at night. Manduria gave us a wonderful wine called Primitivo, which was transported to Hungary and it was renamed Zinfandel and then transported to California, where it became one of the most popular red wine grapes. Um, Julia has given us Rudolf Valentino, many opera singers, designers, maybe Ricardo Muti, depending if he claims that or Naples as his uh, homeland. Um, depends on his mood. Depends on his mood. Spectacular food. It produces 40% of the gra grain in Italy. So the breads, um, Altamura is, is one of the, Altamura, Altabello, Altamura, Altamura has the best bread I know in Italy. The yeah. pastas are historic and the food is ancient in shapes. So that you have orecchiette, ear shaped. You have tarali, which are little biscuits. These shapes go back 2,500 years mm -hmm. and people eat them as they did. There's incredible fish. There's also meat. Um, burrata, which is now a big trend in food around the world, is a cheese that's native to Puglia, Apulia. And so there's sublime eating. There's incredible culture. Federico II, Frederick II, reigned there, and there are palaces everywhere. And it was a place of high culture 800 years ago, the whole region. So it's really very special. Um, and finally, they have, and I'm suddenly forgetting the, the Masseria, the um, buildings that were former farmhouses that have been converted into hotels and resorts. But because the weather and the conditions are so favorable to agriculture, yes, there was poverty, but it was not the kind of grinding poverty that you saw in Calabria and Sicily and Campania because people had food and they had culture and so on. So this native culture of the region goes back thousands of years unbroken. And mm -hmm. that makes it different from cultures in certain other parts of Italy where there were the dark ages and so on. It's part of the fascination and it's left an architectural legacy that is remarkable throughout the region. But that said, I unabashedly say that my favorite city by far in Puglia is Martina Franca. And I would probably put it in my top five or six cities in all of Italy. Wow. So um, I'm prejudiced, <laughs> let's leave it at that. But therefore in this context, this festival was created that uses theaters, but also outdoor spaces. It uses the town in such a way that you can have multiple events happening at once. Because I think it's remarkable that a city of that size, that is frankly far away from the main roads, it's not Innsbruck or Salzburg or Aix-en-Provence or even Spoleto or Verona. Um, it's quite out of the way and you really have to journey to get there, has managed for 49 years to present this remarkable festival. And in a moment, we'll get to it, why it's remarkable artistically. But why do you think, Sebastian, that it's happened that they've managed for 49 years to create and run a festival that's really far away from everything else? Well, I would say, first of all, I have to mention one figure um, who made it all possible, and that was uh, the at then that at that time, 1975, mayor of Martina Franca, and up until February this year, president of the festival, Franco Punzi, who was an, a, a towering figure of a of a very short man, a southern Italian man, who was multiple times uh, um, mayor of, of uh, Martina Franca and extremely. Ex experienced politician and understanding the political system. And I, I will never forget when he, when he, um, when we were in the process of, uh, in, in sort of the court, uh, in the courtship um, uh, moment, when he said, we must make very sure that these conversations uh, remain between the three, four of us and will not go outside until we announce because 
And that's something that needs to be understood, especially in Southern Italy, but pretty much around the world uh, now, um, because the moment we uh, word gets out that we are seeking to um, make a change here, we will awaken political appetites that we will not be able to, um, to control. And I mean, this man, that, that pretty much says everything. He was able to keep politics, himself being a politician, keep politics at bay, at a distance, um, keep them under control, always knowing exactly how to um, respond to approaches from the political side, which of course have, have been there um, over all these years. But this experience is just, just priceless, especially down here where the mafia does play a role, of course, um, even though it's not one of the, one of the uh, worldwide known names or pronounceable names because Sacra Corona Unita <laughs> doesn't come, doesn't roll off your tongue necessarily. Um, and of course, we know that the mafia is not the mafia of the, of the, uh, of the Sicilian mafia of the 80s, um, where bodies disappear in, in acid baths. Um, it, the mafia has now reached the ministries and public administration uh, is wearing dark suits and ties and is pulling the strings uh, in the city and and regional and and uh, national administrations. Um, well, on another maybe sharing a glass of man, uh, of primitivo one day, I can tell you about my experience in Torino, um, having to share the theater with the mafia for a year and forty five days. But um, I'm still alive, so I should write the book quickly before I get before I disappear somehow. Um, but this man, this Franco Punzi, was really, I think, one of the major drivers in making this happen and in keeping it going. And uh, so, this on the let's say on the human and and uh, personnel side. Um, on the other side. The festival, uh, and you said we'll get to the actual festival in a minute. Um, where it takes place, you've you've uh, you've listed um, the attractions and the and the special um, place we we find ourselves in. I think all that uh, makes people want to come back. It's apart from the festival itself, of course, but it's it's really a holistic experience that uh, you come, you make your pilgrimage almost to Puglia. Um, uh, you come in the hottest time of the year because that's when the festival takes place, whether you like it or not. Um, you come in the hottest time of the year, but um, you have all these, all this food, all this culture to take in, all this history to take in to enrich you. And on top of that, you have first-rate opera uh, and, and, and let's say musical experiences of in the widest range. So I think that combined really uh, makes makes one of the main reasons, yes. And, and also, I just geographically want to make this very clear. If people look at the map, they will see the coastline. They will see that there's a train that goes from Bari to Matera, which is in Basilicata. Matera has now become famous as the city of caves and so on. And it used to be one of the poorest places in the world. Um, now it has a certain attraction, but there is that train um, there. One can drive along the coasts. I don't know how to drive, so I use public transportation. But even within this, and even with the fact that Martina Franca is a city of about 50,000 people, even in Puglia, it's not that easy to get to. And you really do have to make a pilgrimage. It's not like going to the coastal roads. It's a long climb up plastic past places like Loco Rotondo, which we didn't mention, which has the truly, which are these ancient conical structures where people live. Um, it's just fascination after fascination. But then you make this long climb and you reach this cool spot. And there's a beautiful, for its formation, uh, rectangular piazza. And there's the hotel park on one side. And on the other side is the door the porta to the city and right there is an inscription because pope john paul ii came and spoke on that spot and you can it feels like a natural theater that mm -hmm. space and i think part of what i love about martina franca and i wrote about this many years ago in opera news is that you go from space to space in the city and each feels like a natural theater like yeah. a piazza after a piazza yeah. with different formations, different acoustics, different visual aesthetics. Yeah. And 
I picture the entire city as being a performing space. Absolutely. And I don't it's think so much local easy. people think of it that way. But when I look at it and I can remember every footstep where I go and where the restaurants are, where the gelato is, I always remember um, mm -hmm. where every single thing is because it makes such a strong visual impression on a person if you're open to that. And so therefore, one really does have to journey. And if one does journey, one tends to stay. You don't come for the night. There are festivals like Verona where you may go for the night and see an opera and then go away. Um, but when if you're going to make that trip to Martina Franca, you stay at least a week and perhaps two. And therefore, you really live the city and the city becomes part of the festival in a way that a lot of the other venues do not, at least in my opinion. Um, now, there's a through line that I see, and we still have not gotten to the artistic programming for this year, that I see in your life, that there's a lot of Baroque. First in Rostock, and I, you were in Innsbruck, and there's a very famous Baroque festival there. Uh, there is Baroque in Southern Italy, architecturally, but also musically. Is the Baroque, has the Baroque been an important through line culturally for you? It has, and it, it continues to, to do so physically as well, because you can't quite see uh, my volumes, but it is quite, it is getting quite Baroque too. So, so I'm, I'm working on, on, on my Baroqueness uh, on all fronts, let's say. No, what, what is the appeal of the Baroque? And define Baroque because it is musical, it's literary, it's all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Define it for you, and then what is the appeal for you? Mm -hmm. For me, the definition is is very much the the let's say the Oxford Dictionary or the 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 the, the, the etymological uh, uh, definition of something being baroque, being over overboardedly uh, uh, decor over decorated, over too much of everything. That's in, in, in just a few words. Too much of everything. Um, too much of everything to then choose from. And that's what I've, I always find in, important for us, for the educated listener or the educated reader or viewer of some sort, um, to be able to take all that way too much of uh, excess of, of information, of input, and then choose, zoom in on that decorative element of that organ, for example, or listen closely for a certain uh, uh, line of ornamentation or a cadenza, um, which which makes something so special and unique to that particular singer and that particular moment. Um, I think that's what I find so fascinating that it that allows us to to really zoom in or out at pleasure and, and get various uh, perspectives that maybe other periods of, if we use the opera uh, the opera, opera as, as an example, other periods like the Verismo don't quite give us because it, it's quite, I mean, Verismo is pretty much straight in the face of, of saying, this is how it means, it needs to be as realistically representing that drama or that emotional dilemma that, that protagonist finds himself or herself in and that needs to be that and you don't really have much room to wiggle or to zoom in and out um, whereas in baroque um, even just even already the structure of the arias the aba uh, with the da capo with the repeat uh, uh, with added ornamentation depending on the availabilities of every of, of each given artist uh, at, at the moment i think there's yeah, the, the, the rich, the wealth and the, the, the freedom to move within the Baroque, I find so fascinating. So for a person who is a viewer or a listener, and when I say viewer, it could be of opera, it could be of Baroque painting, mm -hmm. Baroque architecture. Do you think that there is a greater space for fantasy in the audience member and the viewer than there might be in certain other artistic periods. Uh, I mean, in Bel Canto, which is one of my favorites, I listen to what the musician can do. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily fantasize. In Verismo, in contemporary works, I tend to focus on the narrative. 
Mm -hmm. In Baroque, I find that my mind can wander, not because I'm bored, but just mm -hmm. because it provokes fantasy in me. But I'm wondering, do you think that applies to other people as well? I believe, I believe so. It is inviting, it is opening a world and inviting you in to wander around and take in what you are prepared at each moment to take in. And um, you can be more or less prepared or more or less educated about things. Uh, and you will always find something that will enrich you and that will give you utter enjoyment. Um, and, and so I think, yeah, that's, and, and, and that's me saying who's, the, who's also on the other spectrum, um, the vice president of the International Richard Strauss uh, Society. So, so um, I, I do. <laughs> no I, fantasy there. <laughs> <laughs> The Frau de Schatten is nothing but fantasy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and actually, in the future, I'm going to have on a guest. His name is Larry Wolf, who's a specialist on Die Frau de Schatten. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I'm preparing for that now by listening and reading and studying the score. Oh, hardcore. Um, <laughs> but, um, and it's interesting since we're talking about Richard Strauss, that a lot of his famous works evoke an earlier era, the era of the Baroque, not mm -hmm. necessarily musically, but as the time and setting for the stories, most famously De Rosenkavalier, but others as well. Mm -hmm. um, would you name German, Austrian, Italian, French, English, Irish, Baroque composers that you think are important for listeners to know about? Well, I mean, I mean, there's, there's of course, Gerd Friedrich Händel, who is the one who brought me to the Baroque, uh, to the Baroque uh, era. And um, for me, it was uh, an indelible experience of uh, on on uh, VHS, because at the time we, it was in the early, very early 90s, um, the wall had just come down and, and I was working in the theater uh, next, uh, sort of part-time next to doing my, my, my high school diploma. And uh, we, we were doing a production of Xerxes by Handel um, in German, uh, in our local theater, in the Baroque, in the Baroque Hall in Rostock. Which is just beautiful, well, a real place where we had um, not a, not a theater but a concert hall where we did a staged version of Zerts. And what between dress rehearsal and opening night, when everything was done, uh, the whole cast uh, watched the Nicholas Heitner production of Xerxes from the English National Opera with Anne Mary and and uh, Valerie Masterson and so on with Sir, Sir Charles Charles McCarris uh, conducting, and and that really did it for me. That production, and I've watched that production sort of once a year ever since, in the earlier, year, earlier years, probably 10 times a year. Um, and I never grow tired of it because it is an interpretation. Again, it is, it, it's zooming in, offering us many different uh, layers um, of Baroqueness um, in the interpretation, in the, in the staging. Uh, and the, the musicianship of Anne, of Anne Murray is, is just fabulous. And for me, that became the point when I said, one day I want to be able to hire her and sing for me, I mean, sing for me, sing for the audience that I, I get to program for. Um, and, and the same for uh, Jean Rigby, who in the same production sang Amastra um, with this amazing instrument, very, very unique, amazing sound. Um, and and I did manage to hire them both just before the, them retiring, uh, both in Britain, Britain operas at Theater and Avin, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and Mary as Mrs. Groves and in, in uh, Turn of the Screw, and John uh, Jean Rigby as um, Bianca in Rape of Lucretia. But I'm I'm digressing. So the uh, Handel for me has a very special role and, uh, and a very special place in my heart. I, I was just discussing, I had just met a school group um, uh, this afternoon um, of students here from the schools of Martina Franca, and we were uh, discussing forgotten operas. And so, of course, when the name uh, Vivaldi comes up, because considering that he himself uh, thought that he had or considered that he had written 97 operas of which musicologists have been able to name 47, but of which only 22 
uh, uh, scores, full scores in manuscript uh, survive, two of them in Berlin in the National Library and the other 20 uh, in uh, Turin in the National Library of Turin, where I managed to, be just before leaving Turin in December, I managed to grab and hold in my hands Orlando Furioso in the manuscript, uh, and which of course is, uh, I mean, I think has goosebumps just thinking yeah. of that experience. So Vivaldi um, uh, is one of those examples of how much work there still is to be done into maybe at some point uh, finding these uh, missing scores. Um, then, of course, then there are the, the different periods of the Baroque, right? The different, um, the different uh, uh, moments of musical development. Monteverdi is one of the absolute great master, grandmasters of, of all times. And even though we only know of his three and a half operas um, that, that survive, L'Incoronazione uh, di Popea is just, there's nothing that can ever supplant that opera in greatness and in, in, in being a lesson of what Baroque music sounded then and what it was able to express at a time where we did not have the great arias for the, for the, uh, for the Prima Donna and Primi Uomini, just like a few years later, decades later with Vivaldi and Handel, uh, and where we had the divas fighting each other. It was all about uh, the recitativo style of being flexible and expressive and being able to jump from one expression to a completely opposite one within split seconds, um, uh, rather than being forced into this corsage of of the, the, the ABA structure. Um, I think, so for, for me, Monteverdi is one of the great ones that absolutely has to be named. Um, of course, we, we're still moving between Germany and Italy, or if we consider Handel also at some point then English. Um, um, of course, if we think of Platé uh, uh, by Rameau um, wow. and, and those, those operas, Lui, Rameau, two very, two, two very different uh, French styles of Baroque, um, I think I mean, you mentioned Luli in passing, but it may not have been heard. Did you say yes. Luli? I okay. said Luli. Yes. Tuscan, as we know. Exactly. Yes. Italian. Luli. <laughs> Luli, who moved to France, but he was yes. Italian as well. Yeah. Um, um, but, and, and we have so yeah. many so many composers from Puglia, actually, um, from that period. Um, of course, they all went to Naples, uh, to the conservatories in Naples to study. But um, uh, I mean, if we think about Tommaso Traetta, fabulous music, um, of course, better known maybe Paisiello from Taranto. Uh, if we think of um, Le, uh, uh, Leo from uh, San Vito dei Normanni, another one of these small towns just past Ostuni from seen from Martina. Um, uh, and then, of course, the later ones, uh, Mercadante, Giordano, and so on. But and if we just look at the Baroque composers, Piccini, and so on, um, such a wealth of uh, people that came from here, were educated in, in Naples, and then went out into the world, just like Lully then went to Paris and, uh, and make a fortune and make his, make, make his name rather than a fortune in, in the French Baroque. I do want to underline a name that you said in passing. He's not in any way Baroque, but Umberto Giordano was one of my very favorite composers yeah. of all. And he's yes. from Puglia. And he's famous for Andrea Chenier, but also Fedora, Siberia, and a lot more glorious, glorious composer who was sort of a contemporary of Puccini. Yeah. Um, okay, so now let's go to the festival itself. What is notable about this festival since almost the very beginning, and I think that uh, the founders wow. really were very courageous in what they did, is that basically it's a festival that presents unknown, forgotten, or little-known works, operas, and others. So this means that you have to travel the length of the Italian peninsula, climb all the way up big hills to get to this place where you're going to see five operas that you've never heard or seen before, and perhaps have never heard mentioned before. It takes either a great deal of courage or openness it's not like going to a festival where you have Aida and Carmen and La Boheme and La Traviata. Great though those are, I love them all. But um, you're traveling to hear music that you've never heard before and may never hear again. And from the very beginning, the festival did that. Why did they do that? 
Well, I heard say, people say that it was because they knew they couldn't compete with the existing, uh, let's say, festivals, because I hear people say that there are some places up in the north that do those AIDAs uh, um, and, and those other operas that you mentioned. Those for are unnamable, years. Un <laughs> unnameable ones. <laughs> They've been doing that for a while up there somewhere. Um, uh, I cannot Angelata, mention these. Verona. <laughs> oh, you, you name them. Okay, I cannot because they're direct competitors. Just kidding. I know, but <laughs> I love Machidat and I love Verona. I've worked in both festivals, so of I course. love them. Very, they have very they have different. Experience. Yeah, a very different experience, but great, great experiences. Uh, catering to a different type of audience, to a different experience, to a, a huge show, as in the case of well, both actually, but Verona even more so now. And um, a bit like Bregenz, uh, I mean, if you have those thousands of people that you have to somehow uh, entertain and provide something um, for, um, yes, that's a different, it's a completely different approach. I, I just want listeners to know Bregenz is a festival in Western Austria in which they build a raft on a lake and they do one opera a year, whether it's Porgy and Bess or Andrea Chenier or something, Rigoletto, and they will do it for a, a period of time. And visitors will arrive from Austria, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, um, elsewhere, but primarily that area, to sit by the lake, see the opera on the platform, have lovely food, have Spaziergang and go for lovely walks. It's yeah. a very pleasant experience, and I like Bregenz, but it's just a different kind of opera festival than what we're talking about here. Absolutely, it is. I think. Uh, I mean, uh, summer is the is the season of festival. It's. Uh, I mean, it's the, the fifth season has started, right? Festival season, and they are everywhere, and especially in Austria, every village has its own festival. Um, and Bregenz has managed to to keep its core uh, and and be become so unique with that. With that, uh, uh, I mean, those images that we, you will never forget of those. Even, and even I have never had one thing. Them. At the other end of Austria, in eastern Austria, last week, my guest was Daniel Serafin, who is the oh. artistic director and head general director of the Oper im Steinbruch, which is a Roman marble quarry that is, they also kind of like Bregenz, they do one opera a year this year, it's Carmen. And audiences travel and they have the experience of good food and nature and an opera all as a package. Mm -hmm. I saw one opera there once. It was in, in Otello, still with uh, Anton Guadagno conducting one of yeah. his last shows. And it, we got rained on. And I, I, I just remember being soaking wet by the time the opera had to be stopped. Um, so, uh, well, open air, right? That's, that's yeah. what you get. Here, the likelihood of, of, of it raining, especially this year, is rather slim. So... Let's keep our fingers crossed. Well, when you sing John Nellanote Densa under a rainstorm, that's something. <laughs> 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 okay, so now let's, we've been postponing about talking about the festival. Let's talk about this particular one, mm -hmm. um, the wonderful operas that are done there. Let's talk about this season specifically being the 49th, and I don't know if you've revealed the 50th, but obviously the 50th will be very special when you do it. Yes. Um, for what immediately, uh, I mean, made me immediately say yes when I was uh, asked uh, was this uh, this character of, of the festival, of the, 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 the sposalizio in Italian, the, 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 the marriage, marriage the, the, in a way, the, the marriage. Of, yes. The pairing. The, uh, of, of uh, research and practical theater, because that's what I'm interested in. There are tens of thousands of operas that haven't been performed yet or, or haven't have, have been forgotten or lost. Um, and some of them for a good reason, we, we all know that, um, but to actually go out and look for them, search for them and try to evaluate whether um, in the 21st century, there's a good reason to show that music or tell that story um, related to us or not, or give it as a historical uh, uh, sort of museum uh, uh, piece. Um, I mean, that that is a very huge responsibility, but also hugely exciting uh, to do that work. And then, of course, do all the regular work of um, planning it and putting it into, uh, into motion and putting it on a stage. Um, so for me, 
this is what what I was interested in most, especially because at the time I was also running uh, Teatro Regio in Torino, uh, where the audience was expecting more regular operas, and that's where um, I had to do the Nabucco's uh, Bohemian Butterflies of this world. So, as an outlet, as a vent, um, this was just very extremely welcome. Um, this year. Where last year was my first program in, in Martina Franca, and I wanted it to be a reminder to all of us that there's more out there than just 19th century Italian opera. Um, even though we're looking at uh, forgotten operas, but still from that period, there's more out there. There's 350 years of, of operatic creation out there that we're forgetting if we only look at the 19th century. So between Rossini and Puccini. Um, and um, we are looking, we're forgetting the rest of the world with uh, with those, I mean, <laughs> adjectives don't come to me now because they would all be superlatives of the contributions of what these other languages and cultures have given, have made of opera and how they've made opera their own, all coming from Italy, from from, from Florence in the beginning. So, um, so I wanted to have one representative uh, of each century um, uh, to tell each particular period, um, and of course, them being uh, li very uh, li little known or very rarely performed operas. This year, so it became a panoramic sort of view of what 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 else is out there. Um, uh, this year, I wanted to. I mean, you mentioned uh, our friends and, and colleagues in the Ukraine. Uh, there is a war going on. There is one war going on that we're talking about. There's, there are many other wars happening in the world right now that we're not talking about for whatever reason. Let's not go into, into that, into those. Um, uh, there is a financial crisis that we're all suffering from. And, uh, uh, and uh, I just thought this is a summer festival. This is a summer festival in, a peer, in, in an area where people come to go on holidays to escape everyday uh, burdens and, and worries. So why not for once? And I promise from next year on, we will go back to killing Sopranos. Um, there's no doubt about that. But this year for once, dedicate the festival, this edition to the fest of the festival to, if you want a surgical, um, a surgical uh, exploration or study of comedy on stage. And um, I chose to do five staged operas uh, uh, again this year, which we did already last year, five P titles, which is a lot more than had usually been done. Um, so these five titles um, should all come from the operetta. And there are some colleagues of yours, some journalists out there who, who are with, you know, La puzza sotto il naso. I can't translate right now. Right. There's smug. Yes, smug about it, saying, "Oh well, if, if you're now doing operetta, then I will I will sit this one out." Um, and okay, we, let's let's do get into that in a moment because I think it's very important to how we deal with operetta because it's because it is part of our cultural heritage. And it is part of our responsibility to keep that alive. But let's go there later, maybe, if you like. But um, to have operetta and buffo opera, or uh, dramma buffo, or how, I mean, there's many, many different uh, uh, descriptions on, and names for it. Um, comedy on stage uh, in different, from different periods and from different uh, uh, geographical areas. Um, let's say the, the, the regular audience will just come and have a good time. But for, for those who are interested in getting under the skin, there will be things to discover, things to uh, compare. Um, for example, if I'm looking at a Pietro Auletta uh, from a completely forgotten a composer from the Neapolitan school, who in 1737 um, premiered his Orazio, L'Orazio, ossia il tutore di musica, or the music teacher. Um, uh, and from the Neapolitan school, and then a few years later, uh, Florian Leopold Gassmann, this Bohemian, German-speaking, uh, uh, but Bohemian uh, composer, um, uh, first performed in Venice, and then at the court in Vienna, his uh, Uccellatori, the bird catchers, or however you want to translate them, um, from the Venetian school, 
on uh, the Lonely, Greta by, yeah. by Goldoni, exactly. Yeah. So you have the, the juxtaposition of the two schools of buffo opera that in this in the 18th century were competing um, over the uh, over who who was the best in, in Italy in Italian opera. Um, so this there's a little uh, juxtaposition and for people to just get a glimpse of either and then make up their own minds or not, just take it in. Um, there will be a uh, the Salon Operetta, the only surviving operetta by Jules Massenet, um, whom uh, uh, your audience will know, of course, for, well, at least three of his 28 operas. In Italy, it's only three that are actually being performed. Um, but uh, he did write two uh, operettas for a Salon in, in Paris, and uh, we're doing it, actually, I can see the lights through the window because they're doing the, anto, uh, the, 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 pre, the piano dress rehearsal right now of it. We're doing it in the courtyard of, our, of the cloister of Saint Dominic, Saint Dominic here of, of uh, where we have our offices. Um, and that's because it's a very intimate space and sort of our salon in a way. Um, a salon operetta by Massenet, which uh, was written 150 years ago uh, and can give you and give us an idea of that specific size and intimacy and storytelling of a great composer that we don't know at all from this mm -hmm. side. Um, and there will be, uh, um, uh, next week we will open um, Il Paese dei Campanelli, uh, the, 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 the land or the, the village, one could say the village of the, of the bells, oh. um, by uh, Ranzato Lombardo, uh, from which has its 100th anniversary this year, from 1923, um, which will be conducted by no one less than our music director, Fabio Luisi, who is very uh, well known to the American yeah, audience. And just by the way, the fact that one of the greatest conductors in the world is your music director says a lot about the festival of Martina Franca, Fabio Luis. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. yes, thank you for, for saying that because absolutely it, it is it opens many doors because it's yeah. hard to get people to even pronounce Festival della Valle d'Itria or even less to name where it is. But if I say our music director is Fabio Luisi, then everybody says, oh, wow. Yeah. And, and they know which level of, of quality to expect. And, um, and the fact that it was Fabi Luisi who asked me um, if uh, to, to please plan uh, Paese dei Campanelli, which he had once in 2008 conducted for German radio um, and therefore had already gotten his hands into, um, had he just said to me, I hear it's meant to be a good, a good operetta, I would have made, tried to make him change his mind. But the fact that he had already conducted it, I mean, who am I to say to a Fabi Luisi, well, musically, it can't be worth much because it's an operetta, right? He knows exactly what he, he's talking about. And if he, with his knowledge of the piece, re, uh, feels it's, uh, it is worth revisiting for him at his time, uh, it's worth his time to get back into it and bring out the qualities, the musical qualities of this piece to an Italian audience. Um, I think that says a lot. And so, of course, I said right away, yes, let's find the year when we can do it. And then I did my homework, not knowing Paese dei Campanelli. I did my homework, found out that it was from 1923. So I said, well, the obvious year for us to do it would be um, 2023. 2023. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I have this South, South, America, South African Italian uh, stage director, Alessandro Talevi, staging it, who has great experience with, uh, with uh, dancers, actors, singers, uh, sort of a whole operatic, uh, operetta cast uh, on stage and, and uh, coordinating and choreographing them. Um, and it's, it's going to be a great show. Um, so that uh, is, is sort of the big Italian operetta. And I'm missing, oh, I'm missing uh, the one you just Turco opened. Uh, in, in Turco in Italia. In Italia, exactly. Uh, which is, um, if we just take the name and the composer, of course, um, the most popular opera, and I, I, I wouldn't mind if people or in you would now say, well, but why would Martina Franca go to do uh, a Turco in Italia, which is pretty much standard repertoire. Uh, now it is sort oh, of not the really, and I have a particular relationship with this opera. Um, you're younger, so I don't know if you ever met Alberto Zeda. Yes, you did. Alberto Zeda was this magnificent small man who was just he was 
Rossini down to his blood type. He was <laughs> Rossini, the spirit of Rossini. He knew more about Rossini than anyone else. He was one of the founders and guides of the Rossini Festival. He conducted a lot in Spain. He was from Milan. His eyes would light up when he would touch a Rossini score. He and, had been music director at Martina Franca for a while, too. Yes, as that as well. And he would take on younger people like you, like me, to work with him on specific projects. And very specifically, when he was working on the critical edition of Il Turco in Italia, I was his assistant. Mm -hmm. So therefore, of Rossini operas, I know the, you know, Italiana and Barber and William Tell and Semiramide, but more than most people, I actually know Il Turco in Italia. So I fully <laughs> understand why you're doing it. I guess Rossini's famous, but this is not, as acknowledged as it could and should be. No. It has a lot in common with Italian and Algeri, but it's different. It's it is different, yes. And yeah. it suffered it suffered uh, from that this uh, chronological vicinity to Italiana because critics at the time just claimed that oh well he just wants to ride out on that success and just invert the role. So it's not the Italian woman going to uh, to uh, to Algeria, but it's the Turk now coming to Italy and just um, but it is so much more than that. And it is it is one of the two Rossini operas that bring in this meta meta theatrical uh, uh, aspect into play of um, not quite being a play in the play, but being ha having the figure of the poet uh, interrupt or walking alongside the characters and the, the action of the of the production of the of the play um, of the plot, uh, looking for a plot or claiming to be looking for a plot for an opera himself, and then uh, realizing at some point that he's actually in the middle of what what is a plot that he will then then use, and but still even manipulating the characters into finding um, the the the, the etofina, the happy ending. Uh, in the end, so it's a very interesting, um, uh, uh, very interesting Rossini opera in that it that is not usual in in his in his oeuvre, and very interesting then um, that it is a nice bridge between Orazio, which is all about uh, teaching singers in order to then put them on a stage, and so where that is theater in the making on stage. And here we have this, and then we go on to the to the operetta um, another hundred and ten years later, or hundred nine mm -hmm. years later. Um, but what I wanted to say, um, it is not only about uh, less or uh, rarely performed operas, but also about rarely performed versions of operas. And in this case, um, Turco in Italia was premiered in eighteen fourteen at La Scala. Um, under a lot of time pressure. He was, uh, Rossini was really under pressure and in fact reverted to some music by other composers um, and, and so on. So that he was not very happy with that himself. Um, so one year later um, in uh, Florence and then in Rome, especially for Rome in 1815, he uh, adapted uh, that original score. He had some a few better singers at his disposal. Um, uh, Fiorilla, the, the, the leading lady uh, soprano, who has who had much more, uh, it, who was much more agile and had much better coloratura. So he could now supplant the sort of well-known aria, uh, Fiorilla's aria, Consider for Lia Maggiore, um, for another one that requires much more agility. Um, and that has been recorded by, uh, I think, only by Beverly Sills and by Mariela Di Villa. Um, but it's hardly ever performed because it's all, I wouldn't say it's kind of singable. With a good technique, you can sing. But it's hard to find the people that can actually do it justice. Yeah. Um, so this is the version that we've decided um, really to go to, back to pure Rossini, to kick out the music that was not his and really just stick to uh, that version, um, and that is, again, within the DNA of our festival to propose something that is otherwise rarely heard, or if you have, um, I mean, uh, uh, we still have uh, until the 6th of August, uh, so whoever wants to hop on a plane and come over, we have uh, performances of Turco all the way to the end uh, of August, uh, of, of the festival, uh, so you can still catch it, because you will most likely not get to see it. Um, definitely not in the States, but probably not even in Europe in the next few years. Now, I do want to ask you, casting these operas, um, 
you've cast an artist I don't know, Giuliana Genfaldoni as mm -hmm. Fiorilla. Um, not an easy role. Where do you, as artistic director, and where does the festival cast its net to find singers? Because through my experience with the festival, it's not necessarily that you had the most famous people. You often had people at the beginning of their careers who, who show great promise. And in this, I did want to create a parenthesis. Another place where you and I have worked is Wexford, which is sort of at the other end of Europe, um, at the edge, and is a festival that does unusual operas, many of them Italian. There's a large Italian DNA. Early on, it had Pavarotti and Frani when they were very new artists. Mm -hmm. And there is that commonality of doing things that are unusual repertory. But the fact that Wexford is really as far as you can get from our yeah, no, yes. and you're the only two festivals who really do this to any extent. Um, I know where they get their singers from, but where do you get your singers from? Well, I'm, uh, I mean, it's, I come from that world of, of casting, right? And, and so um, I still have my pulse on the, on the situation. I am uh, regularly, I don't really have very much time for it, but I do regularly sit in juries of uh, competitions. Um, there are, there are a few serious ones that, that are worth uh, the time. Um, I've created two myself, uh, the, the Chesty competition within the Innsbruck uh, Fest, uh, Baroque Fest, Music Festival um, and, and the Glyndebourne Opera Cup. Um, and, uh, and so I, I see a lot of young singers coming up through those competitions. For example, our, our Selim, uh, Adolfo Corrado, who now just very recently won the BBC Cardiff Singer of the World competition, yeah. um, the first one going to Italy in 37 years. Um, that, uh, that was an amazing thing. But for, I came uh, across him for the first time in 21 when he sang, uh, participated in the Chesty competition. And I refused to take him into the finals despite the amazing instrument because he was simply not really, I mean, audibly not interested in Baroque. He just he just <laughs> wanted to make himself heard. And I said, uh, I mean, vocally, you're absolutely uh, the, the most interesting instrument of the whole competition. Um, but the, there's a risk if I put you, if I let you go into the finals, there's a risk of you winning the competition and we would be sending the wrong signal to you and to the rest of the world uh, by saying it's enough to have an instrument. Because I have an amazing instrument, a Bechstein from 1930, sitting at home. I, I can I barely have time, but I can't really play it well. Um, it was more for a singer to learn my notes, right? Um, but I would not expect ever to be winning a, uh, something just be, because I have that sitting at home. Um, just like I do not think that a singer just for possessing an amazing instrument should be winning anything. Um, making music is uh, starts where a lot of hard work in preparation, in, in stylistic preparation, in awareness, in curiosity, and so on, has gone into making that instrument function in an interesting way. And that's where music starts, not where, where it flourishes. That's where it starts. And so I told him... I do want to add, I think it's very constructive the way you gave Andrea, uh, I'm sorry, Adolfo, this advice in that, yes, he has a glorious voice. But when you kind of let him down, you told him why. Yes. And you, it's important. I've sat on juries and sometimes the contestants are allowed to come speak to the jurors after and we can have conversations. And other times it's not allowed at all. And my inclination would always be to give constructive advice and say, this is what I think. Um, yes. I remember once sitting on a jury where I noticed a singer who I thought was really special. None of the other jurors thought that she was. I spoke to her privately and I, I said, I don't want you to be discouraged, but I think this is what you need to think about as you construct your career, yeah. Yeah. because I want more people to notice your specialness that I think I noticed. And because competitions can be awful for singers. They pay a lot of money to get into some of them. It's Often, in my experience, the best person comes in second. Mm -hmm. I never <laughs> quite know why that is. And I always tell people who are doing casting, if you look at a competition, look who came in second because that's the best artist. Yeah. 
It's, uh, I absolutely agree. And in my competitions, I always insist that there has to be feedback to the singers so that, because, I mean, the chances are clear. Only one person usually can win the competition. So that means all the others will go home uh, uh, disappointed. Or we can make that into an experience where everybody can take home something that they can work on. And um, and so in that case, of course, he was disappointed. Uh, he was clearly he's clearly one who, who's heard many times or oh, what an amazing instrument you have. Um, so uh, I said, let's do it this way. But I do invite you to come to Teatro Reggio and I invited him for four roles, <laughs> which had nothing to do with Baroque uh, and and which he did perfectly. Um, Starting roles, you know, making him grow. Uh, Mandarino in Turandot next to a uh, uh, Michele Pertusi and uh, some some other great singers. Um, and now the time has come for Celine uh, in his home region because he is from Apulia, he's from Lecce. Yeah. Um, so so that's a wonderful thing. So that's that was that was him. Giuliana Gianfredoni, I've known, who is our Fiorilla, I've known for. Um, a, a few years now, and I've hired her in, in various occasions. She, she was one of the Liu's in that same production, by the way, in, in, in Teatro Reggio. Um, last year, she sang a fabulous Beatrice di Tenda uh, in concert version here at the, uh, uh, in the festival. And, uh, and the only doubt I had was whether she could be a mischievous enough to be a Fiorella, because vocally I had no doubts that she could sing this version. Um, amazingly well, and uh, uh, I mean, we've just heard it. And these days, it's just just amazing what she can do with it vocally. What I was a bit less sure about was the acting, um, so that she could read because she reads, needs to be a, be able to be a beast, a bit like a Norina beast. Type. Yeah. Um, and she she pulled that out, and she pulled that uh, <laughs> out of a hat, and and it it does work. But I've known her uh, for a few years now. Uh, I cannot even tell you when I heard her for the first time. Um, so uh, it is the the constantly listening to people. Um, I, I always have audition dates um, here or wherever wherever else. And I do have here also, with, along with the festival, I also run the Belcanto Academy, uh, which is a place where I, I tr we train uh, about 20 this year. I took 21 singers from all over the world. Um, there is always about 300 uh, applications. Um, we listen to uh, about 100 of them live in auditions in here in Martina, in Berlin, and in Sevilla. Uh, originally also in Moscow, but then the war came broke out, broke out um, to get close to get closer to where the voices are um, because as you say Martin, to reach Martina is quite quite an odyssey yeah. um, so uh, to make it easier for the young singers and, and less expensive um, so that too uh, I have uh, now 20 people uh, this year 20 people last year 20 people the year before that, I, that we're training that I get to know very well uh, and that I can insert in some of the operas so the Uccellatori for example um, is completely cast by people from the Academy. Mm -hmm. So there is so much that we can cover. I don't know. You probably don't want to reveal yet the 50th year, which will be important. Do you have your philosophy in place for the 50th year about what you want to point toward? Mm -hmm. I do want to uh, uh, go back to the well, celebrate the DNA of the festival because in 50 years, I think that's that's the core of what makes it work and interesting. Um, so I want to have one uh, one title that is sort of an, uh, to take a bow uh, uh, in front of the history of the festival, an important title um, that is a little more popular, but that played a very important role in the in the history of the festival and making it internationally known. Um, uh, last year we had Grace Bunbury here to give her the um, the, uh, the Premio Celletti, Rodolfo Celletti being the the, uh, the first artistic director of the festival, and for many years and very outspoken, uh, let's say, voice specialist, uh, very opinionated one can say, but very educated about voices and training voices, and um, uh, he had insisted that. Um, uh, a certain opera, it's so easy now to, to guess what the opera will be next year, but um, I'll, I'll leave it to your guests to, to do their homework 
Um, so Grace Bunbury came here in 1977 and sang the title role of this opera, and that's what really put the festival on the international map. Um, and that's why I thought she had a personal rep uh, relationship with Rodolfo Celletti. So I wanted her, she, we flew her in, and she she was just a, a wonderful presence for our audience. And, and then, of yeah. course, a few months later, she passed away. But what a, an amazing presence. Uh, and and memory, memories that came back flooding to her, one could really tell. So um, one title will definitely be sort of that kind of bow uh, before the, the history and the, the importance of the festival. One will bring back uh, a, a Napoleon composer um, that uh, is not Umberto Giordano, but, but also not Baroque. So again, you go and take your pick uh, of an opera which will have its 200th anniversary uh, next year. Um, and a very interesting opera that has not been performed in modern times at all, and that we're actually now preparing uh, uh, a readable Mercadante? edition. Mercadante? Hmm. <laughs> 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 Just a guess. <laughs> and now just just go down the list of how many operas were uh, he, he he opened in 20, 1824, right? But uh, so, but I'm not naming names. Okay. You are so. Um, and so that will be a very special because, of course, Mark Mercadante, I mean, the music is fabulous, um, but we need to work with very experienced directors to make the plot plausible and digestible for, uh, for an audience today. That can easily go wrong. I've just seen a production, I'm not going to mention where, but a few months ago, a production where I thought, good Lord, I mean, we might as well have left that in, in, in the archives. Um, and that could absolutely take place here as well. I mean, this could absolutely happen that we get to a point where there is an opera. And I think over these many years that I've seen and that you've seen productions here, um, at the editions of the festival, that there will be uh, pieces who, well, nice effort in bringing it back and proposing it. But I think we all know why it will probably not have another life. Right. And so this can this is always a risk we're taking, but it is a risk so worth taking and so exciting to be taking. Right. So the Apulian composer um, to sort of be on that strand of the of the Martina DNA and another opera that um, has its 180th anniversary. Um, uh, and there will just uh, in, in December, there will be a new critical edition coming out by Bärenreiter um, editions uh, of this of this opera. Um, that uh, has not been performed forever, and I'm very much looking forward to that. So those are the three main, and then there will also be a Baroque title, of course. But so that's the that's the plan. So very much um, honoring the DNA of the festival. Mm -hmm. For for eighty for eight for 2025, I've commissioned yeah. a new opera already uh, in oh. order to to start the new the, the next fifty years of the festival. Um, with the 51st edition with a view into the future. Um, so just to give that out, outlook. So as listeners know, I always ask my guests to dip into the Adagio catalog and find interesting, inspiring works or composers or artists. And Handel predominates, not surprisingly, and I'm very happy with that, of course. Um, we have Bach. We have... Camille Saint-Saëns two times. How come Camille Saint-Saëns? Yes. Um, I was thinking of uh, how you framed it. Uh, were composers, musicians, artists that, that inspired me. And in the case of the Carnival um, of the Animals uh, and, the, and the Swan uh, by Saint-Saëns, um, it was really... For me, because I'm of a, of a generation where it was Uliana Lopatkina, prima ballerina of uh, the Marinsky Theater um, uh, and ballet, uh, who was just who had just mesmerized me in the years when I lived in Moscow in the 90s, um, and and I saw her in the Bolshoi, and I saw her as as a guest, and I saw her uh, the documentaries on her on Russian television and so on. Um, she just mesmerized me, and her swan is just something that that will always stay with me and we know there's there was Plisetskaya before her who had diff very different qualities I mean her hands were were even more expressive um, for Lopatkin it was more the leg work and the, the footwork um, uh, there was uh, uh, 
yeah, I mean, the, the, the three great ones. And for me, uh, the Swan is so closely connected with Lopatkina, who, who inspired me uh, in, in so many ways that I thought, even though it may be slightly too kitschy of a choice for all yeah. the rest of, for all the rest that's on that list, um, it is so inspiring uh, to me that I wanted to put it there and join. And, and well, part of why I asked, are you familiar with the poems, the verses by Ogden Nash that he composed? That accompany the... Yes. The, the, yes. The reason I ask is one time I... I do a lot of public speaking, performing. I was hired as the narrator to do the Ogden Nash poems for a chamber performance of the Carnival of the Animals in Greece. Oh, wow. <laughs> kind of strange, because here I was reciting very American language and verse to a Greek audience that oh. was not, even if they spoke English, they were not understanding the particular wit but they nodded very appreciatively in the, <laughs> his descriptions of the different animals and then the beautiful chamber music. So it was a beautiful outdoor night in Greece yeah. and it was much appreciated, I think. I know that they liked hearing the poems, but it was so completely unexpected for them yeah. because they were <laughs> expecting a more traditional version of Camille Saint-Saëns, but you're the first person of all my 175 guests who has selected this music, so that's why I wanted to ask you. But you also chose um, a selection from Samson et Dalila, mm -hmm. Samson Delilah, but not that, the one that one usually expects. Yes, because I, yeah, I mean... Chagra Villa Montagna. Yes, you, you, you asked me about uh, the casting experience, and if I hear one more or uh, or the other one uh, in an audition sung especially by a 23 year old Russian Russian mezzo soprano uh, killing herself by uh, while singing it because that's what her her teachers has have been yep. leading her towards um, I I will just explode from from fury um, but this particular choice was because um, of again an artist and inter interpreter uh, who. Um, who made it so very special, and that is uh, Dima, Dima Khorostovsky, um, mm -hmm. who, sorry, this is, uh, he, he sang so many things that maybe more, had more to do with him as an artist and as a Russian, deeply Russian, uh, uh, Russian trained and Russian, cultured uh, singer, um, but I just love that sound. And I just love that sound, singing French and singing this this duet, which um, again, and with, with another great uh, Russian singer with Olga Baradina, um, I think together, she may always come uh, uh, across as a bit boring. Um, and so I, no. I uh, <laughs> but no. I mean, I, let, let's, say, let's say a bit safe sounding. Uh, a bit safe no. sound. Olga Borodina was the most stunning Marfa in Kovanchina by Musorsi, one of my favorite operas, but also was one of the funniest Isabellas in Italian in Algeria. Oh, great. Not wow. because she tried to be funny, but she yeah. did it completely seriously. She didn't <laughs> act funny at all like Marilyn <laughs> Horn or Cecilia yeah. Bartoli. She <laughs> was completely serious, and that's what made it so very funny. That made it funny. Unintentionally. Isn't it? But I'm going to take a moment then and let's pay a little bit of a tribute to Dmitry Borostovsky because yes. I, I knew him, I worked with him. I think he was misunderstood in certain ways. Yes. Um, he had the challenge of being incredibly handsome and charismatic, which in a way, like Jonas Kaufman, gets in the way of their artistry because mm -hmm. people react to their beauty and the, the beauty of the voices and so forth. Um I teach Italian opera at New York University, and I have guests join me all the time. And when you come to New York, you can join me. Um, these are all recorded and streamed far and away the most viewed of all of my programs. Um, I think even more than Morella Franey doing her last public appearance in America <laughs> was Dmitry Vorosovsky. After he died, my program with him went viral and people can wow. go to YouTube and enter Fred Plotkin, Dmitry Borostovsky, and you can find it. Um, he 
number one, he had the most extraordinary breath control this side of Montserrat Cavalier. Which, which made 80, him win, win the Cardiff Singer of the World competition in 87 before Bryn Turfel, right? Defeating Bryn Turfel, yes. Bryn Turfel, I think, won the song competition, but the opera aspect yeah. was Vorostovsky. And, um, you know, he was very handsome as a young man with dark hair, but his hair went silver very quickly, and that was part of the, the look. Um, he was a much better actor than he was given credit for. He had a huge affinity for Verdi, mm -hmm. whatever we call the Verdi baritone roles. For people who don't know, he was stricken with brain cancer quite young and fought it very publicly, uh, came back to the Met. He made a recording with Nadine Sierra of Rigoletto because he wanted to document his Rigoletto. Um, he came back to the Met at a gala where no one knew he was coming and Peter Gell, the general manager, secretly arranged for him to come. He sang Cortigiani from Rigoletto. Everybody was in tears. Uh, he did a last Trovatore at the Met with Anna Netrebko and a very good cast. And he was extraordinary to the end. But he also was a big advocate for contemporary Soviet and Russian composers. Sviridov, I believe, was the one of them a song cycle called Russia Cast Adrift, mm -hmm. then these recordings exist too. And while, yes, his Valentin and Fa Faust, all of his French and his Italian music is terrific, I always ask people to go back and listen to Dima, to Dmitry Vorostovsky in Russian. His connection to his language, his culture, his Siberian-ness, he always yes. said that he was Siberian, not Russian, um, made him an extraordinary artist who had to deal. I remember once he sang at Carnegie Hall and women and some men were just so intoxicated with his looks mm -hmm. that they were cheering and applauding everything. And he was singing these big Russian song cycles and he had to ask the audience, please calm down, please listen to the music. Mm -hmm. Stop applauding me and listen to the music. Um, talk about your feelings about Dima, who was great. I mean, uh, for me, uh, my first uh, encounter with him was around um, Onegin. Um, and I mean, Russian is my first foreign language, and I, I've lived in Russia for a long time. And I always try to go back. Well, now it's a difficult period for many reasons, really. But um, uh, it's, I mean, his Anegin was so special, as you say, because of his connection to the language and to him making making the Pushkin poetry come to life um, and and not being uh, sort of just uh, poured out with the Tchaikovsky's music water, but I mean, really come to life and flourish. And and that's what I always look for in in auditions uh, when I have Russian artists auditioning for me. Um, I always want them to first and foremost sing in their own language to see because usually they butcher any other language they they they're, they're giving they're, they're trying to sing in. Um, but so I want to see whether they can at least um, honor and and do justice to their own language and make that beauty come out. Because if they can, if they have that sensitivity, then maybe there's a chance that we can do with a lot of work, a lot of hard work, we can get them to do that job also in other languages. If they can't even do it in Russian, then let's forget about it. And, and that happens, unfortunately, more often than not. And with Dima, this was really the first uh, the first encounter, uh, Anyegin, then Yelitsky, and, uh, and, and which were just so breathtaking. Again, the breast, Queen of breast Spades, Pete Dom. Yeah, yeah, yes, the Queen of Spades. Um, and, and then really the song cycles, also the, uh, the traditional uh, uh, Russian romances, so the Russian folk songs. Um, there's, there's some amazing, and I mean, after hearing him sing that, I had to immediately go and buy the, the scores and try them out for myself because such amazing um, depth um, that he man managed to, to give to them. And there's one song, um, it's, it's from a 60s movie, um, I think 60s, uh, from, from Soviet television um, called um, uh, uh, How Young We Were. Um, and you can find it on YouTube, uh, the whole movie. Well, you can find it in Russian. I'm not sure if it's 
I'm sure it's, it has subtitles of some sort. Um, I just watched it the other day again, and th that song is from there, but, but the way he sings it, almost reminiscent and almost saying goodbye in a concert that he gave with Orbelian conducting in, in Moscow a few years ago. Um, that is one of the most moving um, things that I will remember of him. Um, it was in the Kremlin uh, Palace, uh, a huge televised uh, concert. Um, I mean, I've, whenever I am in Moscow, I go um, to pay tribute to him by his grave uh, on Novodivici Cemetery, um, which is a must stop for me to just, I mean, to see all, all Sushil Stakovich and Prokofiev and Chekhov and all my heroes, Shalyapik even, um, but to, to, to pay respect. And of course, my dear friends, uh, Slava and, and Galina Rostakovich and Vishnevskaya, which is one of the other choices. I put there with Slava and Mstislav Rostakovich playing the, the Bach suite uh, on his cello. That because of the emotional bond that created with that music and with him uh, when he came just for three, four days after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, come, he came, he flew to Berlin from Paris, I think it was, flew to there and just sat and played these Bach suites there, just himself there by, with, his, with his cello. Then, of course, the media taking a, a notice and, and immediately there was this big rush of, of media, from, the media from all over the world. But really, there was just Slava playing that, that music. And so that's, that's what, the reason behind the choice of the, of the Bach suites. So it's interesting that we who work in opera and perhaps people who love opera and attend opera, a question that we could ask everybody is whose graves do you go visit mm -hmm. to pay tribute? Because I only go to three. Two of them are in Vienna and one is in New York. The one in New York is Leonard Bernstein in Brooklyn. Yeah. But the two in Vienna are Leonie Riesenek and Hildegard Behrens. That every time I'm in Vienna, I, I mean... Hildegard, unfortunately, went there more recently, but Lainey and I, I got to work with her a lot. For me, there's no greatest opera singer of all, but the one with whom I had the greatest experiences, mm -hmm. I mean, there are many, Luciano Pavarotti, Leontine Price, Joan Sutherland, many, Mirella Franey. But I think that if I really had to talk about the global experience of opera, for me, it yeah. would have been Leonie Riesenek. Yeah. So that I always go to visit her in Vienna when I'm there. Anyway, <laughs> um, here we are talking about grades. I know, but and not Denise. The, the, just one other on your list because you really provide a wonderful list. Um, I see it as, and my check is non-existent. Svanda Dudak is this Svanda the Dudelzak Pfeiffer? The back Pfeiffer, okay. yes. That's how I know it in the German. Yes, with Emma okay. Yes. Why this one? Well, I have a, a very special memory of it, um, and then a personal connection to it as well, which accompanies has been accompanying me for nineteen years. But um, uh, first of all, it was the first production I ever saw staged by Damiano Micheletto um, at the Wexford Festival in two thousand two. It must have been or three, no, two, two I would no, two or three. Um, where he staged, that was his first opera, uh, and I've been uh, observing him ever since, and then I got him to, ben to Vienna for his Vienna debut, and we did five or six operas there together, and then I brought him to Gleinborn um, for the Katya uh, two years ago. So um, I, it's, so that, that was the first time that I saw him uh, stage something, and I've, it was a really uh, very thought through staging. Um, and of course, it's, uh, acquainted me with the music. And then years later, well, two years later, I met my husband, uh, my now husband at the, at the festival in Wexford. Uh, he was singing there and he um, uh, recorded and that recording that, that I chose there is him singing um, the, the role of Babinski, sort of the, the Robin Hood type character of the opera. Um, in well, mischievous, more mischievous than Robin Hood, more like devilish of it. Um, in the opera, from a, a really amazing production they did in Dresden at the Semper Oper, and this is a production. This is a CD that came out from that production, and it's um, it's 
almost unsingable because it sits extremely low for the tenor. Um, yeah. I mean, this whole the rubber song that I put on there sits extremely low, but then of course he has to go up. Um, of course, it's a Slavic opera, so you need to show your high notes. And it's <laughs> it's so demanding, but I love what my husband's name is Ladislav Elgar, um, and I don't need to... Uh, I didn't hear his name, but I just want to know what country he's from. He's from Czech, from the Czech Republic. So. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. so, so what just what he does with the language is so beautiful because nobody else on that recording is Czech, and and so you have really it, it does stick out particular in a particular way, and he manages to make that that uh, language come to life almost like and in a different way, of course, like Dima managed with with the Russian because he has such a love for his. For his his mother tongue, even though we've been living in Austria for well, almost nineteen years now mm -hmm. uh, together, and then Italy and so on. But what he does with that language is just just amazing, and he sings that repertoire, of course, all, all over the world. Uh, and so coming up, well, it's a, it's more of the glagolitic mass in Montreal, but um, that's now in September. Um, so again, more or less his language, let's say. Um, so it's, will you be in Montreal fact, as well? I will try to make my way up because it, uh, you know, New York is, New York is just south of Montreal. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> just remind I'll you. On, I'll hop on a bicycle. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So so therefore, not so much to to make a, a advertisement for my husband because he doesn't need that, but because it is really it's a, a fabulous opera by mm -hmm. a composer from 1927 who then immigrated to the United States and lost his ways there. He was just not, um, I mean, Weinberger clearly, uh, uh, it's clear why he, why he immigrated. Um, and, uh, but one of those lost souls who did not make it, despite of an incredible talent, and you hear it in this music, it is absolutely mind boggling what the man is capable of writing. Uh, yeah. And then he just could never uh, uh, hold, you know, find find a footing in the US and then yeah. committed suicide some late, some years later. But yeah. what great music. So I had to put that there. Well, Sebastian Schwartz, if I could be in Italy right now, no matter what the temperature is, I would find <laughs> my way up to Martina Franca. I would ask you to reserve a burrata for me and a ticket to a performance, but a burrata. Um, I hope people have been as inspired by this conversation as I have to understand that what we're talking about is a very special place. And I've discovered a very special person in charge there um, who really understands what makes Martina Franca and the Festival Valeditria so really unusual. Um, so if people are listening in Albania, in Greece, in Corfu, in um, Southern Italy, in Italy in general, Get down to Martina Frank. It's hot everywhere, so you may as well go to a higher elevation. Exactly. Where it's cooler. And really, in the festival runs through August 6th, I believe. Yes. And uh, it's very special. It's, as I said at the beginning, one of my favorite festivals in the world in one of my favorite cities in Italy. And um, it has so much to offer. And if you can't do it this year, try to get there for the 50th next summer. That's what I'll be yes. expecting you. I, I'll do my best. <laughs> Sebastian, <laughs> thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. It's been a great pleasure and an honor to, to finally meet you this way. I, I mean, thank we have you. So, many, so many friends in common. Thank we you so do. much for having me. We do. And I'll see you soon, I hope. New York I in hope. September after Montreal. That would be great. great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.